This story starts when I was around 11. My family had always been a normal one, at least as normal as a military family can be. My dad had been a naval officer until he retired in 1992. Soon after being stationed in the Philippines, he and my mom met and got married. When it was announced Subic Bay was being closed, dad decided to call it quits. This was the first time they mentioned moving to the states, but they ultimately chose not to. Five years passed and my mom was pregnant with my future brother, Robert. I'm not sure if he was planned, but everyone in my family was looking forward to his arrival. The discussion of moving to America was brought up again and this time my dad decided we should. His reasoning was because his parents were getting older and they deserved more time with their grandchildren. So, by the time the next winter holidays came along, we were living in a suburban house not far from them. For any kid that has grown up in another country, the culture shock of America can be hard to come to terms with. I wasn't any different in that regard. However, the person who had a much harder time adjusting was my mother. Without any of her own family nearby, she couldn't shake her feelings of isolation and invisibility. What perhaps made things even tougher for her was not having anyone she knew who could help her with my brother. Although my dad's folks were close, she hadn't yet become comfortable around them. This resulted in her becoming very attached to him. Even when my dad held him, she would stand by nervously, unable to relax until he was back in her arms. This is why when Robert began getting sick, she became more unhinged. At first, he would occasionally vomit. Not abnormal as far as I know, but within a week, the sickness grew far worse. Finally, we had to rush him to the hospital late one night. After a boatload of tests, he was diagnosed with a rare infection. We were all understandably upset, but Mom was beside herself. A few days passed and Robert was released. He seemed to be getting better. It was chalked up to a freak incident and things began to get back to normal. Unfortunately, two months later, the symptoms returned. Robert was readmitted to the hospital and the tests were all repeated. The diagnosis was the same. We began to fear something around our home was causing it. My dad went through the house with a fine tooth comb, but nothing came up. The doctors were clueless too, but Robert's condition slowly began to improve. His doctors hinted that he may be released by the end of the week. Everything was looking good, but not 24 hours later, his condition took a downturn. Mom was convinced he was dying and called for a priest to give him his last rites. What we didn't know at the time was, the hospital had contacted the police after Robert started to decline again. The nurses had become suspicious that someone in the family was making him sick. They believed he was being poisoned. The overwhelming consensus was my mom. Some more tests were done to confirm the poison theory and the following morning, my mother was arrested. Of course, we were all shocked. My dad was furious and almost got arrested himself. Nobody believed she was capable of doing something so heinous, especially to her own child. Her and dad went so far as to do an interview with the local news, and watching it now after all this time, you can see how much she loved the attention. Robert's symptoms did go away after mom's arrest. He couldn't be discharged back into our home until the case was resolved, so my dad's folks took him in. The family continued to stand by her, but as the trial drew closer, her guilt became more and more possible to us. In the years she and Robert had been apart, his infection hadn't returned. The final nail in her coffin, so to speak, was the trial. After hearing all the evidence they had against her, she had no supporters left. As you can probably guess, the jury found her guilty and she was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Since her conviction, we had almost no contact with her. Dad understandably filed for divorce not long after the trial, and after he remarried, she was never heard from again. This was until Robert turned 18. Now that he was an adult, Mom was free to contact him. She still maintained her innocence after all these years, and that's probably why her attempts at parole were denied. She continued to send him a letter a month for almost a year. Each one begged him to visit her. The thing is, Robert had no connections with her. Our stepmother was his mother all but in blood and he had no desire to go see a stranger in prison. 
Since Robert blew her off, I feared that she may soon try to contact me. Her time inside is drawing to a close. As far as I know, she doesn't have anywhere to live when she gets released. I'm almost positive this was her motivation for contacting Robert. If she has any hopes of being a part of my life, she can forget it. I'm a grown man with a family. A family I love. No one capable of what she did is welcome anywhere near them. Three twenty-six a.m., June twenty-second of two thousand six. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had been dreaming of leaving for a long time, but this day was when the dream became a reality. If I hadn't been driven to the point of ending my own life, I probably wouldn't have left. When your mother beats you almost daily, you lose that desire to live that most children have. Even after putting up with all that, I can confidently say I regret my decision. With the benefit of hindsight, I probably should have gone to the police or even a teacher rather than flee from the safety of my own hometown. We can't, unfortunately, go back in time and reverse the bad choices we make. However, I hope, after I share a few stories of my time on the road, it may make the next kid reading this think twice before they run away. The first thing that happened about eight months into my time, our group had been in Austin almost two weeks. My boyfriend was 19. Although he obviously wasn't a model citizen, he kept me safe. He and I had been crashing at this pot dealer's house. My boyfriend, who we'll call Chad for the time being, had clearly befriended this dude because he was always drowning in weed. The guy had so much, he didn't mind letting folks take a little on credit. We greatly abused this kindness during our stay. No one in their right mind ever stiffed him, until Chad came along. The dealer had been cool until the last few days before we were planning to leave. When he was asked, Chad assured him he'd get his money before we left. The problem was, I knew he didn't have it. This wasn't the type of guy you wanted to mess with. I expressed my fears to Chad, but he said not to worry about it. I had no choice but to trust him. This turned out to be a bad idea. The night before we left, we were packing up and the dealer came home. I could tell he was mad even before he began demanding the money. Unbeknownst to me, Chad had been with some of our friends and bragging about how he was going to leave without paying his debt. Somebody must have talked because our host was livid. Our ride was already waiting outside and Chad tried to use this as an excuse to get away. The dealer wasn't having it. Chad, being the arrogant fool he was, told me to take our stuff out of the car and wait. He claimed it wouldn't take more than a few minutes. I was terrified, of course, but it was all out of my hands. I loaded our bags into the trunk and asked our ride to wait. The yelling got so bad I could hear it in the car. This carried on for almost ten minutes until the house grew silent. I figured everything had been resolved and let out a big sigh of relief. No sooner had I then heard two quick pops come from inside the house. I screamed out uncontrollably and began sobbing. I didn't even have a chance to decide my next move before I saw the door open and the dealer step out. He was holding something and walking swiftly toward the car. I started yelling at the driver to go. She was still shocked and wasn't all there yet. I yelled at her again. Each second he got closer and I became more panicked. I yelled a third time, slapping her on the side to get her attention. It must have worked. He was probably four steps from the car, raising the gun to fire before she hit the gas. I looked back at him as we sped away, full of relief and anguish. The two of us agreed never to mention what happened. Strangely, no one asked where Chad had gone or even acted as if he ever existed. I willingly played along. The next morning, we left Austin, never to return. What happened after that, I have no clue and honestly, I have no desire to ever know. I hope that first story gives you a good perspective on how dangerous life on the road can be, not to mention the poor decisions that a young person without a responsible adult can make. The second story plays out in the last few months of my time as homeless. I was now 17 and had a baby on the way. The father had long since moved on and I was terrified my daughter was going to be born with some kind of problem. 
I didn't have the money to get regular checkups or know about public clinics. This nice lady at one of the shelters told me about this program for girls in my current position. Through a long series of fortunate events, I was offered a place to live. We don't have the time here to lay out everything that happened. I'll just say an amazingly generous couple opened their home to me. Thanks to the kind ladies running the program, I was able to get all the things I needed to ensure a healthy and happy birth. Things were looking up for me. Until my pending living situation got back to the wrong person. This guy had been hanging around in the homeless community for a long time. He himself was not living on the streets. Instead, he provided drugs to the younger girls with the goal of making them dependent so he could pimp them out. He had been trying to sink his hooks into me for a while, but I managed to avoid him. It didn't last, though. One day, he caught me alone and backed me against the wall. He began his usual spiel, but I was far too street smart to fall for it. I told him off, and this was the wrong thing to do. He began gritting his teeth and cursing me, saying that I thought it was too good because I have a home now. He pulled out this long switchblade knife type thing from his pocket and flicked it open. He was waving it uncomfortably close to my now heavily pregnant body. Now I was terrified. I had never really thought much about myself, but my unborn child's life mattered more to me than anything. I started apologizing repeatedly. My mind was spinning in high gear looking for a way out. I did the only thing I could think of. I peed myself. I remembered something a girl had said once. We were talking about being abducted and she said that she would pee herself if it ever happened to her. We laughed about it at the time, but in my present situation I was willing to try anything. Crazy as it may seem, it worked. The dirtbag was so grossed out he told me to go clean myself up. It was my chance to get away and I took it. I knew this wouldn't keep him away forever though. I kept my head down and hid until I could get off the streets. Things got so hectic the last few days, I had to hide under an abandoned house. That's a hair-raising story in itself, but best left for another time. That Monday came around and I was finally able to move in with my host family. I never looked back after that. I'm still not sure exactly why he was pursuing me so vigorously, but I'm thankful to everyone who helped me during that final week. If you hadn't already realized, being a runaway is no way to live. I'm sharing this to impress upon fellow females how very dangerous it is for us to be homeless. If you're a young man, don't go away thinking you have it made. I've seen more than my share of males lose their lives during my four years on the streets. Whether you're male or female, don't make the mistakes I did. It may not seem like it, but there are people out there that can help. You just keep looking. Your life at home may feel like pure torture, but I can promise you it can't hold a candle to growing up on the streets. I can't say for sure when the bullying began. I'd say it was the first grade at the earliest. It was a small town, so there was only one elementary school for all the kids. This is likely why it went on for so long. As we moved on to middle school, it continued. The Whitney family was large from what I remembered, six boys if I recall. My older cousins told me stories of the beatings they suffered at the hands of the older siblings. I don't know if it was something caused by their home life, but Blake Whitney, the youngest of the brood, would carry on the violent tradition. My brother and I were just two of many who grew up under his thumb. We told our parents, but there was little they could do. They had a couple of meetings with the school staff who all excused it as a part of growing up. The principal would talk to him and things would get better for a while, only for the bullying to slowly come back once no one was paying attention. Our family was too poor to move and there were no other schools in the county, so there was little that could be done. As we grew older, my brother and I learned how to avoid our tormentor. The bullying occurred less often, but never completely. Eighth grade started much like all those prior to it. I'd been going to school with the same kids since kindergarten. We all knew each other's names, but the teacher insisted on making us introduce ourselves anyway. I was in third period math class when I heard a name I didn't recognize. I immediately looked up and saw this skinny kid with glasses talking to the class. 
My name's Timmy Coleman. My family just moved here from Tennessee, and I have an older brother named James. He's in the 11th grade. I like to watch cartoons with my brother. We couldn't help but laugh at him. He spoke kind of like a robot and wore these thick, black framed glasses. After class, I introduced myself and asked him where he lived. Despite being dorky, he seemed like a cool kid. I invited him over to my house after school to play games and he was super excited. I couldn't understand why until he had told me he had never had before. His family couldn't afford them. I'd always thought that I was poor because we only had one car, but after I met him, I realized I was almost rich in comparison. Being new to the school, it was only a matter of time before Blake caught wind of Timmy. The two would meet on a Wednesday morning about a month after the term began. I'd all but forgotten about Blake. Perhaps if I hadn't, things wouldn't have turned out so bad. Timmy was walking to class and ran directly into Blake. Knowing him, I'm sure he'd planned it that way. Timmy fell flat on his butt. Blake didn't even give him a chance to stand up. He pushed him back onto the floor and called him a spaz. Timmy apologized and Blake laughed. That's where it would have normally ended, but Timmy said the wrong thing. As Blake walked away, he returned to his feet and asked me a question. Why is that guy such an a-hole? Before I could answer, Blake stopped and turned around. My heart sank. Would you say, you little four-eyed dork? I'm not ashamed to say I was terrified. Blake had made most of my childhood a nightmare and I knew what he was capable of. I tried to push Timmy down the hall, but he seemed confused. His back was turned when Blake threw the first punch. It made solid contact with his head and he dropped like a rock. His head banged against the locker as he fell. Like the coward I am, I stepped back and hoped the beating wouldn't last long. Once he was down, Blake pounced. He began kicking him over and over. Timmy's body was limp. After kicking him five or six times, he chuckled and walked away. Once he was out of sight, I went to check on Timmy. I tried to shake him awake, but he wasn't moving. Panic began to take over and I started crying. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a teacher and ran over to him. I quickly explained that my friend had fallen and wasn't moving. The teacher checked on him and told me to run to the office and get help. The 200 or more yards was probably the furthest my fat little body had ever run before. I told the lady at the counter and she called 911. I didn't wait for instructions. Instead, I ran back down the hall where Timmy was laying. The teacher was giving him CPR, although I wasn't sure what he was doing. I knew it had to be bad. When the ambulance left, I'm almost sure Timmy was breathing. All kinds of adults began swarming around and asking questions. Nobody had been around to see the fight but myself and a few others. Everyone else was already in class. They got around to me and I was too scared to say what had really happened. I just said I had found him that way. This seemed to have convinced them. A principal wrote me a note and told me to go on to class. I did what he said and went on with my day. I couldn't call Timmy's house because they didn't have a phone. I assumed I'd see him the next day or the one after that. The following day he wasn't at school. I decided I'd ride my bike over to his house afterwards. A few minutes after the bell I was walking back to the bike rack and noticed Timmy's brother James. I was about to ask him about Timmy when he approached Blake. He began yelling at him and poking him in the chest. Blake was doing his best to look cool but you could see the fear in his face. I stood about 20 yards away and watched the conversation. Initially, I couldn't hear what he was saying. However, as he spoke, he got louder. The first words I understood were, You beat him to death. He's effing dead because of you. I gasped when I heard this. Surely he didn't mean Timmy. No way. Spit was flying from James's mouth as his yelling quickly became unintelligible. Blake began looking around like he was expecting someone to help him. He became increasingly nervous. I was just waiting for James to begin hitting him any second. Instead, his rant stopped cold and he took a big long breath. He calmly smiled and drew a pistol from his waistband, aimed at Blake's head and pulled the trigger. 
Blake dropped like a sack of potatoes. It took a moment for everyone to process what had just happened. When they did, screaming and running broke out all around me. I was frozen where I stood. He then put the pistol back in his jeans and walked away. A few seconds passed before I had the presence of mind to go for my bike. As I rode away from the school grounds, kids were scrambling everywhere. When I got home, I ran into my room and locked the door. My mind was racing. Not only had one of my friends died, but I had just watched a murder take place mere feet from me. That night at dinner, the shooting was the only thing anyone was talking about. My parents asked me if I had heard about it, but I played dumb and avoided the conversation. I wasn't ready to talk about it, and to be truthful, this is the first time I have. I found it easier just to act as if it never happened until I wasn't sad anymore. Probably not the healthiest way to deal with loss, but it worked for me so far. Maybe I'm just a bad person. I hope not. The cops arrived at the Coleman house just after James did. Despite demands from the police and pleas from his parents, he refused to come out. After the SWAT team stormed the home, it was discovered that he had been dead all along, probably turning the gun on himself as soon as the police first showed up. Everyone was hoping the entire mess had ended, but the Whitneys began talking about suing the Colemans for Blake's murder. They quickly retracted their threats when they realized the Colemans had nothing to take. On the other hand, if the Colemans decided to go after them for Timmy's death, they had a lot to lose. Eventually, both sides went silent and I believe the Colemans moved back to Tennessee. I'm sure had this happened these days, school would have been cancelled for the funerals and every kid would have been forced into counseling for the rest of his life. We had none of that. Not even the ones who witnessed the shooting firsthand. While I may have had a lot of outdated beliefs, I am happy with the way bullying is being dealt with nowadays. I know firsthand that it causes you to hold on to a lot of anger. Because of my experiences, I want to express how important it is to listen to your children. If they tell you they are being bullied, take action right away. Things have changed greatly since I was a kid, some for the better and some not so much. But I do believe if people took bullying as seriously then as they do now, three young men may not have lost their lives in such a senseless and violent way. Dad and I never had a good relationship. Some days were better than others, but overall I didn't much like the man. I wasn't the only one either. He and my mom were constantly fighting, usually about nothing. It seemed like he just had to be that way to people sometimes. I asked her once why she didn't leave him, but according to her, he wasn't always like that. They had been high school sweethearts. She even attended the same college as him just so that they could stay together. Back then, he was kind and a generous man, but after they were married, he began to change. He began getting paranoid and drinking heavily. Initially, everyone thought it was because of the alcohol, but the paranoid episodes were happening even when he wasn't drinking. In those days, he would still apologize for his despicable behavior, but as time went on, the apologies came less and less often, until one day they just stopped. Once the schizophrenia was diagnosed, he finally had an excuse. That was my theory anyway. I wished every day that he could be normal again, but it never happened. In fact, it only got worse. As I neared my 13th birthday, things had grown so bad I considered running away. Dad was unemployed by this point, living off of disability checks and occasionally odd jobs. Drinking consumed almost every minute of his waking hours, and his venom towards me knew no bounds. Even when I thought I'd found a good place to hide, he would burst in screaming, calling me an ungrateful son. Michael, my oldest brother, had moved out the year before. Without him around, no one remained to protect me. That's why I should have known something was very wrong. When I snuck in from school, there was no sign of Dad. No loud TV or noise whatsoever. I took advantage of this and slipped into my room unprotected. The rest of my day was spent like normal, keeping quiet and trolling the internet. The one time I left my room, I tiptoed out to get some food. 
Dad was sitting at the table so quietly I didn't even know he was there. I froze and held my breath, unsure of what was next. Instead of screaming and cursing, he said nothing. I thought he may be asleep, but his eyes were wide open and he looked miles away. I took the opportunity to grab a bag of chips and ran back to my room. Things would only get stranger as the evening went on. About 5.30, I heard him go to his bedroom, but rather than come out for more beer, I didn't hear him for the remainder of the night. Except for a short period just before bed, I was brushing my teeth and something caught my attention. I turned off the water but heard nothing at first. A few seconds passed and I began hearing sobbing. It couldn't have been anyone but Dad. This was impossible. I stuck my head to the wall and listened quietly. Sure enough, I could hear him crying. I've never heard him do anything like this before. As I drifted off that night, I began to have a feeling that I'd never felt in my life. Pity for my father. The following morning, I ate a quick breakfast and left for school as usual. I had a hard time focusing during my classes. The feelings that had stirred the previous night were heavily weighing on my mind. I'd spent so much of my life hating my father... The idea of feeling sorry for him was super confusing. I hoped the day before had just been a positive sign of what was to come between us. As I slipped in the afternoon, I was optimistic but guarded. Just like the day prior, the house was quiet and calm. I dropped my book bag in my room and went to take a leak. When I entered the bathroom, I thought I could hear beeping through the wall. Mom had left for work hours ago. Dad was the only adult left in the house. I hadn't seen him anywhere else, so he had to be in there. Why would he allow it to drone on? Anyone as touchy as him couldn't let that go. It soon began to annoy me. Him being passed out was the only possibility I could think of. I figured I could slip in, turn it off, slip back out without being noticed, so that's what I did. The door was slightly ajar. I pushed it open. As I thought, I could make out a shape sprawled out on the bed. It was dark, but it had to be him. Quickly, I walked over to the far side of the bed. The clock sat on the nightstand, screeching like a banshee. I fumbled around with the buttons until the noise stopped. Finally, I could relax. I turned to walk out, but now the room seemed too quiet. My dad snored like a foghorn when he was drunk, but there wasn't a peep. I carefully leaned over just to check. I made sure not to move the bed. I knew if I woke him, my life would be over. I could see his eyes were open. I began to panic. I threw all caution to the wind and turned on the bedside lamp. I was met with a gruesome and horrifying sight. Not only was he dead, but the pistol he used was still gripped in his left hand. The sight almost made me wretch, so I turned away. Unsure of what to do, I called my mother. Once she got herself together, she told me to call 911, which I did. They couldn't do anything, of course. Just like that, Mom and I were alone. After the shock wore off, I became furious. I didn't understand why he had to die just when things were beginning to improve. I know now that that was a symptom of what was to come. I continued to feel that way for some time. In the ensuing years, however, I would soften toward my father... While I won't say I've come to love the man, the reasons behind some of the things he did did make a bit more sense now. I don't give him a pass though. However, I can't begin to understand what mental illness does to you. However, I can't begin to understand what mental illness does to you. Hopefully, I never will. Nevertheless, I do know what it does to your family. As the arrival of my first child grows ever closer, I pray the dark cloud that consumed my father passes by me. If I do become a victim, I can only hope, if just for my child's sake, I don't grow into the monster he once was. You couldn't possibly remember that. You were too young. This is an idea I hear often, and to be honest, I wouldn't believe it myself had I not experienced it firsthand. It wasn't always this way either. It took a strange series of events just to bring it all surging back. 
From what my shrink tells me, our mind will block out such terrible events in order to preserve our peace of mind. While I did have the small snippet pop up in dreams here and there, I was never able to place where they originated. I'd always attributed them to a forgotten horror movie or television show. I can't say finding out that your mother was murdered is an awesome experience, especially when you always believe she died in a car crash. I suppose when I grew older and had mentioned it, my grandparents figured they were free and clear. I don't hold it against them though. They were far better parents than I would have had otherwise. Why, you ask? Well, the resulting murder and the murderer taking his life would be the best indication. However, it was probably because they were both high school dropouts with raging meth habits. How I ended up healthy is an incredible miracle. Even then, it seemed like they did all they could to kill me. In addition to leaving me with strangers for weeks on end, I was severely undernourished when my grandparents got me. I just wish I would have been with them on New Year's Eve of 1999, and I'll explain why in a moment. With my parents dead, it became of the utmost importance I have a normal childhood. For the most part, I did, all except for the nightmares. Some nights I was troubled by visions of violence and death. Around 11, my grandparents began sending me to therapists. When I became an adult, I sought out a new counselor. We went through the usual getting-to-know-you phase you go through with a new shrink. As we got comfortable with each other, the topic of hypnotism came up. Somehow it had never come up before. He thought it may help to get to the root of the problem with nothing to lose, I agreed. With each appointment, a small yet important part of the puzzle would arise. By the end of our time together, I remembered every little detail of that night. Just to be safe, I had to be sure I wasn't being fed a false narrative. So, through connections I made in school and a few less savory members of the hacking community, I was able to get a hold of my parents' file. This would ultimately change my view of them while, at the same time, make everything so much clearer. Only now could I be sure the story I'm about to tell was real and not some terrifying images cooked up by a young man's overactive imagination. Before I began, be aware the story includes depictions of violence and abuse. If you think you may be triggered by this, stop here. Thank you for all for following thus far. The evening of December 31st, 1999, I was called to the home of Corey and Rita Bryant. Upon arrival, the first thing to grab my attention were the tiny bloody footprints scattered throughout the home. I was told by the responding officer that they belonged to the male toddler of the Bryants. Toddler Bryant was not on scene when I arrived having been taken to the hospital for a full examination. The toddler himself was not injured instead is believed to have walked through the blood of Mrs. Bryant. In the corner of the living room lay the body of Mrs. Bryant. She had been handcuffed to the home's radiator. Next to her body laid a heavy framing hammer covered in what I assumed to be Mrs. Bryant's blood. My preliminary conclusion is that Mrs. Bryant had been beaten until dead by Mr. Bryant. After observing the primary crime scene, I was led to the master bedroom where Mr. Bryant's body was located. It laid slumped at the foot of the bed. A semi-automatic pistol lay next to Mr. Bryant. A small entrance wound was discovered on the right temple and appeared to be the primary cause of death at this time. That was the gist of what happened, although I obviously edited the report for the sake of brevity and personal privacy, it accurately describes what my subconscious had been trying to tell me for so long. Fortunately, I've managed to not suffer from any long-term psychological damage. I count myself lucky in that matter. Despite being somewhat shocked after learning the truth, I'm still able to view everything as if it happened to someone else. And in a way, it kind of did. Twenty years ago, a three-year-old child was present while her father beat his mother to death, only to take his life soon after. I feel terribly sorry for what that little boy must have went through, but that's not me. I'm happy. A well-adjusted man who happened to once have terrible nightmares. Now that I know the truth, my life is great. And I can't remember the last time I didn't sleep like a baby.
I guess I should start by explaining how I grew up. From birth until I was 20, I lived in a lower class trailer park with my parents. I also had a younger brother, but we'll learn more about him later. Although we weren't full-blown trailer trash, we weren't far from it. I don't completely blame my parents for this. They both worked very hard, often at more than one job at a time. The biggest problem was probably that they spent so much of their money on garbage like beer and cigarettes. We possibly could have had a somewhat better lifestyle had they not had such wasteful priorities. Like I said though, we weren't completely dirtbags. They never abused us in any way and we always had plenty of food and clothes. I only wish the people around us cared so much for how they lived. Most of our neighbors did just well enough to not get evicted. It wasn't uncommon to see new faces constantly popping up. The few that managed to stick around any real extent of time were the worst. If you didn't hear them screaming at each other at all times of the day and night, you were running from their vicious mutts. This particular subject is at the root of what I'm sharing with you today. Early on, I made mention of my younger brother, Luke. He was almost five years my junior with these piercing blue eyes. All the mothers were constantly ooing and aahing over how handsome he was. It seemed a bit creepy to me too. But anyhow, he and I didn't make it through a week without some neighbor's dog coming after us. Most of the time, we'd make it back to our house safe and sound. That was until one terrible day when our whole family's life would be changed forever. This happened on a summer morning in 1997. Luke and I were out for the break and playing around the playground in the center of the park. Our mom was at work that morning as usual. The old lady across the road, Sissy, was supposed to be watching us, but she spent most of her time asleep in her recliner. We had been playing Dragon Ball Z or some other role-playing stuff that kids do. He and I were coming back from lunch and I noticed a neighbor's dogs were running loose. They were both some sort of chow mix. From experience, we knew they were mean. Every time we walked by their yard, they barked and growled at us. Under normal circumstances, they would be locked inside a fence, but their alcoholic owner left the gate open all the time. From where we were, it appeared we had plenty of space to make it to safety. Somehow, we'd forgotten about the shortcut and they caught up to us. I'd managed to get away, but Luke wasn't so lucky. I made it about ten steps before I turned back. To my horror, both dogs were on top of him, and since he was so small, they probably had no problem knocking him down. I knew I had to help him, so I ran back and started kicking the one chewing on his face. No matter what I did, neither dog stopped what they were doing. Luke was doing his best to fight back, but it was useless. His screams still hurt my heart today. I'm not sure how long it took, but I finally got the smaller dog to come after me. I hoped the other one would follow, but he continued mauling Luke. I ran for Sissy's trailer, hoping to get her help. She jumped out of her chair when I ran inside. I told her as fast as I could what was happening, and to her credit, she acted fast. She pulled out her pistol from her desk and ran outside. The bigger dog had pretty much lost interest and was just nudging Luke around. Sissy opened fire on him and scared him off. The smaller dog had already left by the time we came out. Luke wasn't moving anymore. His body was a big, bloody mess. Sissy checked his pulse and yelled me to call 911. I may have been young, but I knew what that meant. The paramedics arrived very quickly and we followed the ambulance in Sissy's car. While we waited, she contacted my parents, and they were understandably upset when they got there. Things only got worse when we received the bad news. Luke didn't make it. This is when it finally hit me, and it hit me like a rock. I started crying and for a long time blamed myself for his death. I realize now I did all I could at that age, but kids aren't always logical about that stuff. My dad was beyond furious. As soon as we got to the park, he went looking for the dogs he found them back inside the yard and the owner begged him not to kill them, but it did no good. He'd be charged with animal cruelty later that month, but considering the circumstances, the charges were soon dropped. After Luke's funeral, we did our best to return to normal. Of course, this was easier said than done. For a long time, Mom would break into tears any time Luke's name was mentioned. We did as best we could to honor his memory. 
Every year on his birthday, we'd get together at his grave and say our respects. Both my folks died early, so after they passed, I've carried on with the tradition. Now that I'm an adult, I'm more focused on the good times we had. Wherever he is today, I hope he's happy and he's been reunited with our parents. I pray I'll be able to join them all when my time comes. Both of my parents worked so hard to get to America. They followed all the rules, did all the paperwork, and paid all the money. I'm sure their first day here was one they'd never forget. Then, after going through all of that, they happened to meet each other in a town where Asians are a tiny part of the population. They surely had to think that they'd achieved the American dream. It's too bad that they wouldn't get much time to enjoy it. I'll get to what I mean by that in just a moment. First, I should probably explain how things got us to where we are. For several years after they were married, both my parents worked almost around the clock to make ends meet. Their dream has always been to buy a gas station, make it successful, and pass it on when the time came. I was six when they purchased the store I now own. Money was tight. They couldn't afford to hire anybody for the first few years. However, around the time I was 13, they had a few employees on the payroll. Things were looking good and I got to spend more time with my parents outside the store. Then the night of May 13th, 2003 happened. The day started as normal, but then two people quit. One of them was an assistant manager, so both my folks went in to cover the shift. The store was usually busiest between 5 and 10 p.m. I tried to convince my mom I was old enough to be left alone, but she wasn't having it. Against my wishes, I was dragged along. Most of the night, I surfed the net and talked to my friends on the office phone. Once or twice, I had to go up front to help, but I preferred not to be seen. Things were beginning to wind down at around 9.30. My mother told me to get my things together. We'd be leaving in the next 15 minutes. She went back up front to do a few small tasks. I sat back down and watched the cameras while I waited. A few customers came and went until the store was empty. A few minutes passed and... A tall skinny dude with dreadlocks came in. He just milled about the store and then left without buying anything. No longer than 30 seconds went by when the dreadlock guy came back in with another man. They were both wearing masks, but the guy's hair gave him away. I stood up and locked eyes onto the screen. Each of the men drew pistols and pointed them at my parents. My heart began pounding in my chest. The men were both clearly nervous, constantly looking around and barking orders loudly. My parents were frozen in fear. They made the robbers angry because they weren't moving. Suddenly, the unknown gunman hopped over the counter and struck my father across the forehead with his pistol. My mother screamed and crouched down to check on him. While she was doing this, he fumbled with the register. He couldn't get it open, so he turned to my mother and yelled at her to open it. She did as he said and she was so scared she couldn't get it open either. Things were quickly getting out of control now. The guy behind the register struck my mother on the skull and she stumbled to the floor. The dreadlock guy yelled something I couldn't hear to the other. They both spoke for a second, then the unknown man turned around to my parents and began firing at them. He shot both of them at least four times. Once he was satisfied he'd killed them, he pushed the register off the counter it hit the floor and just popped open. While the dreadlocks guy hurried to empty the register, his partner grabbed an armful of cigarette cartons and hopped back over the counter. Just as they ran out the door, another customer passed them coming in. He just stood inside the door and stared dumbfounded. I ran out of the back office screaming for him to help. I must have scared him. He jumped up and made a little squeak. I yelled at him to call the police, but he stared at me silently. I yelled that they just shot my parents for him to help me, and he finally began to catch on. He stepped forward and looked over the counter. He must have seen them. He jumped over the counter and grabbed the phone. While he called 911, I tried to get my parents to talk. My father wasn't breathing, but my mother was still barely hanging on. It took the longest five minutes of my life for the ambulance to arrive. They quickly left with both my parents, not giving any indication to their status. I was left with the police and the customer. 
I rapidly told them what happened and they gave me a ride to the hospital. And as I sat there waiting for the news, I was all but for sure my life was over. In a matter of a few minutes, the only life I'd ever known was stolen from me. The hours drug on until finally around 1am, I discovered how bleak my future was to be. As most expected, my father didn't make it. The doctors tried their best but were unable to repair the damage. On a good note, my mother was stable and had a positive prognosis. That being said, her recovery was a long road. Even when she was able to work again, she refused to return to the store. The second she began talking about it, she crumbled. This created a vacuum that had to be filled. I was still several years away from being able to take over. It was beginning to look like we were going to have to sell the store. Fortunately, at the eleventh hour, we convinced my uncle to run it until I was ready. He did such a good job that we made enough cash to buy another store. When I took over from him, my mother and I gave it to him as a thank you gift. Sadly, my mother was diagnosed with cancer in 2015. Already weakened, she wasn't able to fight it off, and she passed a year later. I wish I could say the men responsible were made to pay for what they did. Even with the video of the dreadlock guy's face and our statements, both men managed to elude arrest. It wasn't until five years later that the second man was identified and he had been killed during another robbery the year before. The dreadlock guy is still free to this day and the police believe that he fled back to Haiti not long after the robbery. For my parents' sake, I hope he's caught. When all is said and done, I'm very grateful to my parents for giving me the chance at a better life. Had they stayed in Korea, I probably wouldn't be doing as well as I am now. I just wish they both would have got to live long enough to see what I'd achieved with what they'd left me. For context, this happened to me when I was about five years old. Some of the details are still a little fuzzy, and because both my parents don't quite remember what happened, this is largely anecdotal at best. At the time, my parents and I were living with my paternal grandparents, and I was in the front yard, which is quite large, playing by myself and my grandparents Rottweiler Damien. My parents were both inside, not sure exactly what they were doing, but I was definitely alone aside from me and the family dog. Suddenly, at least to my childlike mind, a man in a beige-colored car pulled up at the curb of my grandparents' house. He began talking to me. I'm unsure of what exactly, but at one point I remember him asking me if I wanted a toy. Of course, I said yes, please. He then produces a small little stuffed lion and hands it to me, which I graciously accepted. Suddenly, I remember hearing low growling behind me. Turning my head, I see that Damien is standing pretty close to me, staring directly at the man, growling deep in his throat. Damien was typically a lazy dog, choosing to lounge around and just being a normal, goofy dog, but his breed means he was fiercely protective of his family, especially me. However, I didn't understand why he was so upset at the time, so I told the man thank you for the lion and brought Damien inside, happily clutching my new toy. My parents noticed both that Damien was still looking outside on guard and that I had a new toy in my hand. My dad asked where I got it and I told him the nice man outside gave it to me. Suddenly my dad is on his feet and charged outside. My dad was and still is a tall man with looks that could kill and knew how to fight so he was ready to attack whoever was giving gifts to his one and only daughter at the time but not surprisingly the man and his car were long gone. After that, both my parents sat me down and explained stranger danger and that I can't accept things from people, even if they seem nice. Unfortunately, because the man was already gone and his license plate wasn't written down, we couldn't go to the cops about it. But since no harm was actually done and after washing it, I got to keep the stuff line, which I affectionately named Simba. Thinking back now, I'm quite aware of the dangers of potentially being kidnapped or much worse. I didn't live in the best area at the time, so I'm very lucky that nothing bad actually happened. I'm also forever grateful to Damien for being protective of me and being there with me. Rest in peace, buddy. 
I will name my first Rottweiler after you. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.